Ladies and gents, welcome back to another Engineers podcast. Today I'm joined by Jitendra Sangar, who's an engineering manager at Hopper. He's worked in the travel space for a number of years now. Uh, Hopper have been on a fantastic journey now for 10, 15 years, helping hundreds of millions of travelers across North America uh, save a lot more money on their travel. Today, we've got some really interesting conversations around payments. You know, payments has dominated the world over the last few years. Travel has been a big topic of conversation over the last few years with COVID. So, Jachendra, thanks for coming to join us. Do you want to give the famous intro on Jatendra, your background, and who you are? Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Elliot. Uh, thanks for having me here. Um, I'll give you a brief introduction to myself. Uh, I'm Jitendra, as you know. Um, I worked at Hopper as engineering manager. I'm leading the payments team uh, at Hopper. Joined Hopper in start of 2022 uh, when we were planning to build a full payments team uh, in Europe, and I, I was supposed to lead it. Uh, so, yeah. Before that, I have experience uh, working in B2B travel, working in consumer travel, uh, working in e-commerce and uh, space, of course. How have you seen travel evolve over the last couple of years through your eyes? Um, I have seen it evolve, uh, spe specifically the, the, the period of uncertainty during Corona, right? And then the advent of whole new fintech products around yeah. uh, like Klarna, BNPL, like our firms. So travel is now much more affordable or at least there are, there are things which can make it affordable, right? Earlier, if you want to play, uh, you want to fly to a faraway island, you need like good amount of money upfront, right? But now with Klarna, our firms, BNPLs, uh, you can do that, right? So that's evolving. Um, after the uncertainty of Corona, the, the travel is booming back. So that's the general trend right now. Um, yeah, th th those are my two observations. Uh, okay. Yeah, I'm, I'm being told an awful lot. And I've seen it, you know, my travels this year. It's felt busier, felt being keyword, busier than previous years, you know, when I have traveled. I've obviously given my introduction on Hopper. I think you'll do a better job of that. Can you give us the elevator pitch of who Hopper are in the travel marketplace? Yeah, sure. Uh, so Hopper is a travel app uh, or a travel company, uh, world's fastest growing travel company, okay. which enables uh, users to or customers to save money and travel uh, better. Right. We have around 100 million uh, downloads and we are capturing uh, new markets. With our machine learning and immense amount of data which we have, we have built a fleet of fintech products which are helping or solving all problems ranging from like price volatility to, to trip disruptions, right? Uh, so with our B2B product, right, uh, which we call it like Hopper Cloud, we are syndicating our inventory and our products uh, to other companies who wants to sell travel or who are actually travel companies to offer a differentiated project product to them. So yeah, if you want to know more, uh, hopper.com. Okay. We'll go into Hopper, the fleet of those products in a second. But as I understand it, you're almost white labeling some of those products for companies that actually want to expand into travel. Have I got that right? That's correct. Wow. Okay. So you've almost built the baseline of those fintech products and then resell them. What's that experience been like? Um, that's cool. That's, uh, that's, that's a mindset shift uh, from B to B to B to B. Oh, sorry, B to C to B to B, right? Uh, the way the products are developed, uh, the, the requirements are gathered, uh, the timelines, everything is different than B2C, right? The experimentation is very different, um, sometimes non-existent, right? Uh, so, yeah, uh, it's a very, very uh, 
different ball game than direct consumer. Yeah, I can imagine the mentality shift from you're largely a customer centric as an individual centric business now to supporting a business who want to introduce themselves into travel. That's a shift. Yeah. The life cycles of sales are a very big shift. Yeah. Yeah. That's correct. Okay. So talk to us about these fleet of fintech products and how they make up Hopper and why they're so important to Hopper. Yeah, uh, we have many uh, fintech products. Uh, I can give you a few examples. Like, for example, um, one of fintech products is price freeze. So, for example, you come to Hopper, you see a price, you like it, and you want to freeze it till the time you discuss with your family, friends, make a plan, right? So you don't want that price to lose, right? So you can freeze that price and then come like sometime later and book it, right? So that's one fintech product. Uh, the other fintech product is, um, uh, let's say, uh, disruptions, right? So we want to cover you. If anything happens, we'll cover you. We'll re do the rebooking. You don't have to do anything. And you'll, you will be focusing on your vacation rather than like uh, arranging the logistics. Other one is like cancel for any reason, change for any, any reasons, right? Things happen, uh, weather's change. You don't want to like go to, go to let's say, Austria in, in a rainy season, right? So you want to change your plan based on the weather. So those are like few products which we offer, but there are some others uh, which we can talk about. Uh, yeah, but these are like four main. Okay. Uh, I'm trying to understand the business challenge to that, you know, price freeze as an example. Then I'm trying to understand the software engineering or technical challenge to that. Are you able to help us understand both? Yeah, um, that's not my like subject matter expertise there, right? Uh, but I can give you a brief overview because th there are yeah. other teams who deal with that. Um, but I can give you like price freeze, right? Uh, we have machine learning models. We have enough data on our uh, our end to predict like how likely this price is gonna up, gonna down, right? And based on that, we provide you like, hey, there is a risk, there is not risk. So like based on models output, we give you like, hey, this is what you can uh, do a price freeze on with limited, limited risks on our side, right? Uh, we want to be like at least 95% of the time right, right? <laughs> Otherwise, we'll lose money. Uh, so yeah, there is there are like business challenges, but at the same time, there are engineering challenges like how do you build those models? How do you collect those da that data? Um, and utilize it in in a, in a in a in a commercial way, right? In a in a way where you can actually help user to reduce their anxiety around like, oh, this price can go up and then book without thinking, right? But uh, but at the same time, um, uh, help company to grow as well. Yeah, uh, I think that was the thing. Is in the business, of course, like you put it, has to be ninety five percent right as in they need to ensure that actually they're offering a price to a customer where you're still going to profit from that. Otherwise, it's nonsensical to go and build something for a customer that doesn't actually have commercial value to you, right? You've got a really interesting fleet of payment products. Talk to us about some of that payment scale and what that actually looks like for the business and internationally as well. Yeah, um, I, I can give you a brief around like uh, why payment is important for Hopper, right? Um, and not only for Hopper, it's important for any, any uh, internet company who's doing payments, right? Because payment is a very sensitive subject. Right? It's actual money which is going, uh, changing hands. And if anything happens in between, it creates a lot of anxiety, a lot of, um, a lot of uneasiness in the customer's mind, right? And we want to treat it as that. So that, that's the, the first part of payments, right? Uh, where we want to make it very clear, very easy user interface, transparency around pricing, what, what, is being, what are you paying for, all those things. 
that's why the, the first part why payment is so important for Hopper. The, the second part is as Hopper wants to expand into international markets, right? These markets are very different, right? Something which is very, very common in one market, like for example, credit card is very common in, in a North American market. But if you come to a European market, uh, that's non, non common, right? It's, it's very, um, it's very much expected that you, you do your transactions by bank transfers or uh, other methods, right? If you go to LATAM, right, there, there are credit cards, but they are mostly powered by installments, right? Uh, if you go to APAC, like countries like India or Thailand, right, uh, they, they are mostly on, like India, for example, is on UPI, Unified Payment Interface, which is like bank-to-bank -bank transfer, right? So th these are like, interesting topic to solve right for a company who wants to enter into markets which are very different than north america right that's why uh, payment had uh, or has so much important uh, importance at hopper the third thing is of course uh, we want to improve our conversion right the conversion is like if you want to pay uh, and if you want to buy you should be able to buy right and nothing should stop in between uh, in that uh, process uh, so we want to make sure that once user clicks like pay, nothing breaks after that, right? So we can charge the user. Uh, we can give, um, if something goes wrong, we give them like correct information, communication uh, to, to correct it, right? And uh, at the same time, we want to save cost, right? Because yeah. you don't want to pay like hefty fees on every transaction you're processing uh, for, a, for a user, right? So all of these combined make payment one of the important aspects of Hopper's growth. I think what I've come to learn speaking to enough businesses over the past few years, I've spoken to and worked with a major, major fintech in Amsterdam. I've worked with a business providing a B2C service that have delivered that internationally, I think over a hundred different countries and someone actually quite senior in the business explained the payment architecture to me and how complex that is. And of course, yeah. international payments, like you've discussed, presented the challenges around different countries like to operate in different ways. Yeah. That's just how complex it gets, but it has to be one of your number one priorities as a business, right? Because you have to think about commercially how you're being paid by your customers. That's what's going to keep the lights on or keep the investors happy. Yeah. If that money arrives in your bank account, that's what's important. Yeah, yeah that, that, that's true. Uh, I can give you a small example around like how complex uh, payments in, uh, in international markets uh, can be. And one example is user behavior, right? Uh, if you go to countries like India or uh, like APAC countries, right? And I, I'm I'm an Indian, so I will give you an Indian example, right? Uh, there is uh, there is uh, there is a service called Paytm, right? We use it for paying a lot, lot of stuff online, right? And if you look at the usage of that payment method or payment uh, provider, you'll see a lot more usage, right? But if then then, then uh, a natural hunch will be like, let's enable Paytm for our own uh, uh, own hopper uh, usage, right? But then you realize people are using Paytm for purchasing small amount, uh, small amount things. For example, okay. buying groceries for like 2000 rupees, right? Versus travel is expensive subject, right? Okay. People don't keep that much of amount in their wallets. Yeah. So you want to enable a payment method which can help them to pay for a booking which cost you like 50,000 if it is international ticket, right? So that, that, that's the understanding user behavior in different market. If you go to uh, a market like uh, LATAM, right? People wants to, want to be pay through, pay by actually installments, right? So even though they are using credit cards, they want to buy this travel product on installment on credit card, right? So different uh, challenge altogether. How do you actually get down to that customer level and understand what customers in different countries or regions want? 
yeah so there there are like few things uh, and i will repeat like very very uh, overused term that we are a data driven company uh, and i give you example why we are right uh, when we started payments right uh, we were we were providing ability to pay through only credit card right so if you come to hopper you try to book a hotel you can pay only by credit and imagine a disappointment when you reach to a checkout page and you look direct you you browse through 50 hotels and then you chose one and then you came there and then you can't pay it right so uh, so what we did was like hey there is a need for more payment methods like the choice uh, unlock uh, right so how do we choose like there are like 200 different payment methods in this world uh, which can be used to pay right how do we choose which one to prioritize right so we ran like this qualitative uh, surveys to our users like hey what will we you like to do uh, or like to have on hopper right uh, then we got like some inclination oh we will we like to have something like wallet products right we would like to have bnpl products because travel is a high ticket item right uh, and then there are like again many uh, bnpl products many wallet products right so we ran like smoke smoke test experiments to understand like what will user like the most or wants the most right and then that gave us an idea around like hey these are like five or six payment methods which we need to unlock in order for our conversion to go up in order to not disappoint the user right when they come to a checkout screen so yeah that's how we we chose uh, certain bnpl products and certain wallet products i would say yeah nice I think that's a really interesting one. And going back to user behaviors, I think one of the major, I think B2C players maybe released an article two, three years ago about subscribing to a service. Let's just say if it's Netflix or Spotify as an example, so subscribing to a service with your customer card. And once that card expires, that there was a percentage of cards that then expire that actually the breakdown in service occurs and then a business would then lose revenue because they're not charging that customer customer might forget so i think there was just a small percentage there but customer behavior is so important to actually getting payments from a to b and there's tiny little things in there that can make a big difference if you've got five tiny details like that they can then contribute to a portion of payments that don't end up at b from a yeah yeah that that's very true and i can give you like few examples where yeah. we we did small changes and that led to like a lot of improvements in our stack right uh, please so one of the example is like sometimes you forget or you mistype your cvv right when you are entering a card detail you 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 forgot it right telling you like oh something went wrong doesn't help you much right what went wrong right mm -hmm. just changing the error message explaining that hey there is a security code issue here right just look at that if that is correct or not telling you explicitly like hey this particular card is expired right do you want to update it and we take you to the screen where you can update or add a new card that itself like i think we we saw 1% increment in conversion by just doing better error messages to the user right telling them what went wrong right wow. so that's there uh, and then of course the whole back end stuff uh, is interesting uh, but we can talk about that in detail yeah i i did want to ask you've been in payments for some time how have you seen the advancement of technology advance the growth of payments at internet companies advancement of technology to the internet companies right uh, and i can talk personal experience right uh, I, i come from a very very small village in india right and the penetration of internet there has gone so wide and so deep that everybody is buying stuff from amazon right which is being shipped from mumbai or chennai whatever wherever their warehouse is so the last person who is sitting on the last mile because there is an advancement of technology right is able to buy something from a seller which is sitting in like 
300 miles away, right? So that's one thing that is bringing a lot more population uh, on the internet and then that converts, right? If you look at, and this is not, I'm not telling it with an authority, but if you look at the, the growth of companies like Booking.com or uh, Expedia, or uh, there was a whole internet wave that was happening. A lot more users were coming on internet and then they were capitalizing on that, right? So yeah. there is always uh, the technology and uh, the, the e-commerce, right? Other aspect, um, which I, I can give is especially for the travel thing, right? Because as I already mentioned a couple of times, travel is a big ticket item, right? If you do a vacation, usually you like spend like $4,000, $5,000 if you're doing a, a vacation with a family, right? And with hotels uh, and flights. With availability of payment methods where you can like pay it in 12 installments makes it much easier to plan that vacation every year compared to earlier where you would do it like every two years, right? So that's another advancement in technology which is helping uh, things, right? Yeah. Have you seen buy now, pay later products advance revenue increase because a lot more people are now attracted to hopper because it's an offering yes uh we have seen that conversion improves because people people are able to buy that right and they don't have to upfront commit that much of uh, money we have seen average order value going up so you buy more right uh, oh i I come here, there is a possibility to buy now, pay later. I would try to club both like air and hotel together now, right? Rather than like buying hotels now and planes later, right? So, yeah. Okay, smart. And I can see why. Again, it's back to that user behavior of, I think it's great, buy now, pay later. Uh, I <laughs> think it's definitely got its place on the internet, especially internet payments. It would be good to understand what you think are some of the technical challenges that come with payments. I know we've spoken about the architecture itself or internet payment or sorry, international payments as a collective has its challenges. But what would be the technical challenges that you associate with payments? Yep. Yeah, um, there are like. If, if you're building a payments platform, right, uh, ideally you don't want to go down, right? Because that means a real loss of money, right? So keeping your systems up, uh, preferably like five nines, right? Uh, less preferably four nines, right? Uh, uh, that's one of the biggest challenge, right? The other challenge is how accurate you are, right? Because people are coming People are coming and buying in different currencies. Uh, they are buying multiple products. They are doing, there are a lot of workflows around payments, right? Uh, how accurate you are. Uh, like uh, I, I read a news uh, article sometime back where uh, a ride hailing company end up charging a user like $30,000, right? And I know by working at payments, I know why that could have happened. Right, because the, there are some weird things that can happen uh, behind the scene, right? So how how accurate you are, right? So if somebody is paying in a Colombian currency, you should not charge them in USD, right? Otherwise, they will they will see a huge bill. Uh, and the other aspect is operation, right? Uh, how do you operationalize and route your transactions? to an account or to a processor which has the maximum chance of that being succeeded at the least amount of cost. Okay. Right? So you don't want to route your GBP, the, the pound transaction, to a USD account because then you have cross-border charges, then you have, um, uh, for example, interchange fees, right? So, yeah, you don't want that, right? So these are like, routing, re retrying, uh, making sure that you do everything for that transaction to be successful because that is the end of the game, right? That's where you collect the money. What are the do's and don'ts on retrying, 
and rerouting payments? So now that nowadays the, the with the advent of this uh, payment orchestrated platform, right? Smart routing is is a is a is a kind of buzzword in payments uh, thing, right? You want to smartly route your transaction to a processor or to a particular account where this has the maximum chance of succeeding and as I said, like least amount of cost, right? There are like multiple parameters on which you can route a transaction on, right? How do you get that parameters is another different game altogether, right? So for example, every card has a bin, right? And associated with that bin, you can get a lot of information about that card, right? Using that information, right? And that information can be what card type it is, what card uh, bank issued it, which current country issued it, right? Or was it issued in? Using all that information, can you route your transaction to a particular uh, PSP, right? A payment processor. The other aspect of it is once you reach to a processor, right? Um, processor can decline it for multiple reasons. Right, uh, and I, I just want to clarify two terms here, like issuer and acquirer. The acquirer is our bank, which is merchant's bank. Issuer is the, the the user's card issuing bank, right? So issuer can reject it. Acquirer can say like, oh, I don't ex accept the cards which are in like USD. I only accept uh, INR, right? So there are multiple reasons something can be declined. A, a transaction can be declined from a particular PSP. Right, and then PSP tells us whether this is a soft decline or a hard decline. Right, so for example, an expired card that's a hard decline, you can't do anything. Right, uh, but maybe a fraud rule, uh, maybe the account doesn't accept those kind of currency, those are soft declines. Right, you can go to a different pro processor and tell, like, hey, can you process this transaction? Right, and then get a successful response. Right, so. That saved the transaction. Uh, I think uh, we were processing or we were succeeding 10% of such transactions which failed on particular PSP and then we ret retried on a different one and then we were salvaging 10% of our transactions. Wow. The, these small differences make such a change. You know, I've learned about smart routing in payments. I, I had just a rough non-technical idea of how it worked but these small differences especially building out the right technical protocols having the right architecture is critical to a business especially in the travel space running especially well any competitive internet business where there is a competitor next door to you it's key you get the stuff right yes that's very much true and nowadays uh, as i as i'm saying the payment orchestrator orchestrators are actually helping you to to put routing or configure routing yeah. on themselves like they they can actually route your transactions on your, your behalf right so that's also coming uh, but hopper wanted to have that control right so we built our own routing engine we built our own retry engine uh, in order to have that control and because we want like more parameters, right? We want yep. to be more smart <laughs> than, than the POPs are actually giving us. So, yeah. yeah. No, I bet. Um, I want to touch on the availability of Hopper before we wrap up. That's pretty critical. Smart routing seems really critical, but you need to be available, ready for customers to be able to purchase. How are you solving that problem? Or what challenges do you run into? Yeah. So there are like, and I just want to underline the fact that payment in any company would be a, a tier one service, right? Tier one service that it, it should not go down, right? 100%. I did, right? Um, but at the same time, uh, we this is real world, practical world, right? Things go wrong. Uh, but the idea is how can we salvage those things? How can we mitigate the impact that is happening on the user, right? And there are multiple, or at least two in my mind, ways to tackle that, right? One is more procedural and operational aspects of it. Other is technical aspect, right? 
So I, I can go more into technical first and then we can discuss the definitely. Operation. Right. So technical aspect is how can you make sure that the service which you are running, right, is is redundant, right? So that you you don't end up like it's not single point of failure. Can you divert your traffic from one uh, service to another service and still give some sense of service to the user, right? But the challenge which we face here is the external dependency, right? Because we are not the end of the life cycle of payment, right? Yeah. So there are downstream services uh, which are like payment orchestrator, payment service provider, the card service schemes, and then the bank. Any one of them can fail, yeah. right? Do you have circuit breakers in your uh, code uh, or in your services? Uh, is this easy to migrate traffic from one PSP to another PSP, right? Uh, do you need to deploy core or is it configurable or is it like flip of a switch, right? That's the challenge. Um, how do you handle the failures which are outside of your system and mitigate them? How do you handle the, the failures which are happening internal to your system, right? For example, a service which provides us a user information is gone down, right? How do you mitigate that risk? Can you process a get, guest checkout? Can you, um, can you still salvage this transaction, right? Uh, so that, those are things uh, we want to make sure that anything which is non-essential for this transaction to get processed should not be in the critical path. It should be asynchronous, right? Got you. So, yeah. So these are like few technical challenges uh, on making sure this availability aspects come in. There are operational aspects of it. Like for example, having a, having a strong SOP during incident, how do you manage an incident? If it is internal versus external, right? Um, having clear cut on call policies, great monitoring and alerting systems, so that you should be the first one noticing the issue rather than your upstream services or even users, right? Uh, there should be a standard procedures around informing users what's going on. So, for example, like if if your credit card processing is failing, can you explain or can you tell users to pay through like APMs? Uh, BNPL products or maybe wallet products, right? How fast, how quickly you can do that? That's an operational challenge, right? So, yeah. And I think the operational part as well, you know, technical challenges, I think that they feel as if they're probably a little bit more straightforward. Um, I think the operational challenges are tweak, test, tweak test see how you can get it right for customers at the end of the day um they feel to me as if they're probably the more painful challenges yeah yeah operational yes uh and operational complexity increases mm. as yeah and you get more people on the team right of because course. you want to make sure that everybody should be able to firefight an incident everybody should be able to mitigate the impact the yeah. another aspect which I forgot uh, to talk about in technical challenges is like, what if something goes wrong and then you have to like do the, the salvage piece? So for example, let's say um, one of our POP, the payment orchestrator went down, right? It can yeah. go down at any point of time. So it may happen, right? That one part of the transaction has succeeded and other part failed. Yeah. How do you service that transaction, right? Uh, versus uh, people who are refund, like who are canceling their bookings at that time, right? Actually, cancellation happened, but refund was not originated, right? Because yeah. the service was down. So how do you salvage that refund? How do you manage communication with the user so that they are not anxious what happened to their payment, right? Yeah. So that's another technical challenge. Uh, yeah, the routing of the payments I'm finding is quite an interesting challenge to try yes. and get right and then the communication and even just picking up earlier the error messages just increasing one percent of transactions yeah. or success of transactions just incredible yeah and then there are like back office work right uh, yeah around reconciliation 
So you want to make sure that your what com, what Hopper sees like how we sold this is actually the money coming into the bank, right? Yeah, yeah. So you have to reconcile the whole payment stuff very accurately. Like, oh, this four dollars are coming because we sold this product from our website or app. Right? Yeah. So that's another uh, beast in uh, in itself right? to get that right. Uh, that yeah. that part of the pipe, right? Interesting. You've given us a really solid overview of business, fleet of products, routing or smart routing payments, yes. availability of payments. So thank you for that. It'd be yes. great to understand, you know, next 12 months, where should we as listeners, subscribers expect Hopper to be? What's the business got planned? Yeah, um, whatever I can say, share from my uh, Hopper's uh, perspective and from payments perspective, right? Uh, we want to continue to be world's best travel app. Right? We want to give you better and uh, the solutions which are saving you money, right? We want to increase our uh, our our share holding on B two B stuff. We want to like explore that market as well. And uh, yeah, we want to build this whole uh, upper cloud initiative, which uh, a successful thing, right? From the payment perspective, what I can tell you is like we are just started, right? Yeah. Uh, one and a half year uh, into 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 building uh, this platform, we are just started. There are like so many challenges still left yeah. uh, to be solved architecturally. Um, operationally and uh, domain wise as well because there is every day there are changes in the in the payments world right so yeah and then of course the regulations as we enter into more, more markets as we as we mature as a company uh, the regulations yeah. and the compliance because this is very sensitive topic in, ter- in itself right so we yeah. want to see ourselves to be ready to face the world uh, when we mature love it uh, I think especially I'm going to keep tabs on you guys and girls white labeling some of your fleet of products I think is awesome so I'll be knocking on your door at some point and I'll definitely be checking Hopper out and seeing if I can get myself a deal I, I want to say a big thanks you know come and spend 40 minutes with us talking about what you guys and girls are building looks phenomenal and of course, I wish you the best of luck. And for people listening, Hopper are doing quite a lot of hiring across Europe and the US. So make sure you check this out across product and engineering. Jitendra, a big thank you. And obviously, yeah, best of luck you. for the next 12 months. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for your kind words. And uh, we will try our best to live up to them. Uh, please check out uh, us. And yeah, reach out to me in case if you have any queries, questions. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Bye for now. Hey guys, thanks for watching this episode. Uh, massively appreciate you listening and checking in with us. If you want to find out more about us and what we're doing, please check us out on social media. What we're trying to do at Engineers is build a community to drive knowledge sharing and experiences. On Twitter, we can be found at engineers.io, it's no underscore. We've also got a website which is engineers.io. These links will all be posted in the description. Any feedback and comments are massively appreciated. We're always looking to improve on where we can. Thanks guys.